As business owners, entrepreneurs, family men, it's difficult for us to find the time to put together projects like these. Even though it's something we really want to do, unfortunately, taking care of the things we have to take care of comes first. However, because of viewer support for people like you, we're able to continue doing this. Please consider joining our Patreon and supporting the Burn and Return podcast. You're listening to Burn and Return, a weekly one hour podcast covering news from the agricultural and turf grass industries. When you hear the DJ scratch, you know what that means. It means it is time for this week's episode of Burn and Return. How is everybody doing? My name is Matt. Sometimes I go by the Grass Factor Martin. And tonight, I am joined by the finest gentleman on planet Earth. Behind the scenes, we do have J-Ping. I don't want to leave him out and let him know that he is included in that. (laughs) J-Ping, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. (laughs) Okay, just making sure, just making sure. Uh, in addition to that, we also have uh, Ryan DeMay and uh, Ray Ito. Gentlemen, how the hell are you doing? Well, you know, a um, couple of things. One, I'm just happy to be the hairiest nutsack in this room right now. That's that's one thing. The, uh, the second part is that uh, before the show, the pre-show, which is really, honest to God, probably the best five to 35 minutes of any time that we talk and the only people that are privy to it are typically uh our, our patrons so uh if you want to get on board for that you can always do that that's, but right. that's the realest of real talk right there is the pre-show um that being said there were some some conversations going on in the background there about uh our upcoming christmas specials we do have santa and i'm told this year mrs claus will be making an appearance for our santa episode so uh, God bless her. God bless him. And we'll see them here. Uh, the show before Christmas, J pink. What's the date on that show? Remind me December 21st for Santa, December 21st for Santa. And then on December 28th, a big one, uh, last year we gave over $10,000 to the St. Jude hospital, uh, and research center. And we are going to be rolling that back with a goal this year, this year of 20 K. So we're going to make 20 K. And one night for St. Jude and uh, what we were talking about, but nobody really knows. There's only four people on this earth that know right now <laughs> about some of the special prizes we'll be giving away for our, uh, our mega donors. So be ready, uh, save some of that Christmas money up and uh, give it to the kids of St. Jude. And we will give you uh, some free gifts if you, uh, if you're into that kind of thing. So anyway, gentlemen, uh, that's what I got going. Ray. Everything okay down there? Yeah, everything's all copacetic at the moment. <laughs> did, did did anybody did, did anybody catch Ray on one last night? By the way, <laughs> oh, was he? Oh, he, Ray Ray was on one, and uh, we'll, we'll 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 talk about it in the in the Discord. But man, I could not stop laughing. I haven't laughed that hard in a 20 minute span in a long time. It was, it was hilarious, but we'll, we'll, we'll save that. We'll save that for the patrons. Cause boy, it was, it was funny. La Toxica. Uh, gentlemen, let's check out this oh, week's headlines. That. <laughs> See. <laughs> Nothing to fear here. This is just the- How do you say, uh, crush your head like a watermelon in Espanol? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> uh, Aldo, oh. can you can you get us hooked up with that? Because uh, yeah. we might we might have to title an episode that at some point. I'm, I'll just I'm say sure Yolanda. That's how you spell it, Yolanda. <laughs> 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 I was going to say Yannick Garcia, but you know it is what it is. Um, <laughs> Gray's Robotics. Uh, I think I think everybody has heard this name at least once, right? At one yeah. time or another, it's it's been around. It's been in the news. Uh, and after testing the commercial robotic mower at DFW Airport last summer, Dallas Base is now putting its G3 model on the market for pre-order. It can mow 1.6 uh, 1.6 acres an hour with eight hours of runtime for airports, golf courses, and more. The company says. 
Uh, the G3 electric robotic mower has a five foot wide mowing deck and is able to mow 1.6 acres an hour. Uh, that is extensive battery life. Uh, it delivers eight hours of runtime. The mower's three metal mulching blades operate at 3,000 RPMs, ensuring a consistent and even cut, while advanced sensors allow for mowing on varying terrains, make it versatile for all kinds of landscapes, the company said. Intuitive app for real-time monitoring and more. Uh, it prioritizes the safety of the mower with a 360-degree optical suite and computer vision technology to detect and avoid obstacles. Uh, it comes with an intuitive app for real-time monitoring, adjustments, and software updates. Today marks a pivotal moment for Grays as we introduce G3, one of the most advanced robotic systems on the market today, uh, Logan Faye said in a statement. Uh, we're excited to offer our customers an opportunity to be among the first to experience the future of lawn maintenance. We believe that innovation combined with sustainability is the way forward, and our new mower is a testament to that. We are taking pre-orders via our website now. There's limited availability in the initial release. Um, anyway, it goes on and talks a bit more about this. But uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to say is that I what, what, we have seen uh, a few of these uh, uh, kind of pop up here and there. And I would say Gray's as a mower was one of the earlier ones on the startup scene. Am I remembering that wrong? Am I confusing them with someone else? No, they were the first ones that really pushed hard into raising capital. I mean, I think their first round was like eighteen million, and they have mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a PE firm that's backing them too. So, um, a, a significant amount of money has been pumped into this, and I'm but realizing now they just hired a new P or a new CEO. Go on. Uh, I was going to say, uh, does does anybody have an update on how many units they have in the market right now? I don't think they have any. I think this is, they, they had LOIs, they had letters of intent from everybody. That was mm -hmm. pretty much it. And mm -hmm. don't know that they have anything out there right now. So, that, and that's, that's what I thought. And, but I'm, I'm going to say this, I do not want to lessen what, uh, what, what these people have done. It is, it is, it is truly a work of art, what they've done. Uh, it, this is, this is innovation at its finest. And I don't want to mitigate or, or minimize that at all. I don't want to take anything away from it. But um, again, you know, it's it's awesome that they have these LOIs, and I guarantee you they can sell them if they can get it produced. I want to see this produced at scale, right? Um, that is that is a hurdle. That is a monster hurdle to overcome. And uh, I mean, we we see it all over the industry. How many people have great ideas that just can't get it to scale, right? Uh, I'll raise my own hand in, in that particular one. It's tough. And, uh, but it, anyway, you know, I would like to see this. What the other thing that's interesting to me too, is that before they have, uh, really put their units up for, uh, mark, uh, purchase, they have gone through many iterations. I've noticed as well too. Um, I've seen everything from like bolt on units to, uh, now a fully autonomous unit here that is like its own standalone deck and system. Um, so it looks like with that capital, it has allowed them to truly put forth the the best initial public offering possible. They're not a public company. I'm using IPO in a completely different sense here, but their product, their initial product offering uh, to be as, as legit as humanly possible. So I'm not going to lie. I'm actually really excited to see these out in the marketplace. Um, Ray, I know, I know you are going to have a, a a less than charitable take on this. I'm curious, just right off the bat, when you see it, what are your thoughts? You know, that would be the ideal unit for these rough cut areas because I'm familiar with a lot of rough cut areas, and unfortunately, what I've become aware of is how much labor is wasted because. You know, I've had actually a slight, uh, you know, rethink on the whole robotic mower revolution. Uh, you hear that, uh, Sean Smith? And, you know, my thought is, is robotically mow and then put all of these areas on a top-notch agronomic program. Throw the money you save in having some poor schlubs string trim and mow into a first class vegetation management program
I'm not going to lie. I'm, I was a little shocked to hear that. Uh, Demay, I know you are probably in more tune with, uh, with, with people that are interested in implementing these at scale. Um, what are you, what are you hearing on this front? I think what what will be interesting is that if they go after those verticals where there's like no people around, right? So like airports, uh, industrial areas, things like that, I think they're going to have uh, a, a little bit easier road to hoe. I think that um, what I'm hearing in the parks and rec space and more functional type areas, right? Schools, things like that is insurance carriers are absolutely opposed to something like this on the property, right? So whether it's owned, it's contracted, it's leased, whatever the uh, buying arrangement is, it's simply uh, intolerable, right? For a lot of these insurance carriers. So I think they can scale and, and there's certainly acres and acres of, you know, airport runways, warehouses, things like that, where there's nobody around. I think the question becomes is who manages these things? I think that's the one thing that uh, a lot of these robotics companies are seeing right now is, you know, some of the scale issues in terms of having boots on the ground with end users to be able to operate them and getting those folks trained, getting them to adopt and use all the fe features and facets of the technology that are available to them uh, instead of just really dumb kind of set it and forget it type approaches. So anyway, um, should be interesting to see how, uh, how Graze goes down. Uh, without a doubt. Um, I'm, I'm legitimately excited to see what happens. Uh, Tampa Bay. However, we have some good news coming out of here. Well, good for I don't know, I don't know who what or whatever, but it is news at least and we can we can at least cover that that part of it. If I can get this link to load you abysmal sack of shit. Um anyway, cheer cheer up. Tampa Bay lawn watering restrictions approved amid drought. Uh, residents in Pinellas, Ca uh, Pasco and Hillsborough counties will be limited to irrigating one day a week beginning in December. Uh, so, uh, why in God's green earth is it doing this to me? Um, I can't read the whole article because it is, hang on, hang on. There's, there's, there's a method for that. There we go. Uh, Southwest Florida water officials voted Tuesday to issue a water shortage uh, order, limiting outdoor watering to one day per week in Tampa Bay beginning next month. I don't know why I'm burping all of a sudden. This is disgusting. The vote by Southwest Florida management districts. Governing board came after the driest rainy season in Tampa Bay in about more in more than two decades. The order covers the entirety of the water management district, including 11 whole counties and parts of five others. Um, uh, in the rest of the district, the use of twice per week watering schedules will remain, except where local governments have imposed stricter measures. But wasteful and necessary watering, such as hosing down a driveway, will be prohibited. Uh, the mm -hmm. district wide order goes into effect November 21st. Watering down, hosing down a driveway. Is that a, is, is that, that a frequent thing in Florida? Like I'm, um, I did how that's do you cool your concrete or something? What is this? Act, the, actually, Matt, let, let me explain this to you. A lot of people in these more tropical regions do not use leaf blowers or brooms to clean grass clippings or dust off of driveways or sidewalks. Instead, oh, and just hosing it down that way. I see what you're saying. They, they, just, they just break out the uh, the water hose and they wash down because I actually see quite a bit of this uh, in Hawaii too. People, don't... yeah, that 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 actually does make sense. I was thinking just like you know, it's hot outside. I better I better cool off the driveway. Uh, you know, the no, simpleton no, brain no, no, in no. me. <laughs> uh, the. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, the move came with the backing of the Tampa Bay Water, the public supplier that uh, provides water to most of uh, the, the three major counties. Chuck Carden, the uh, supplier's general manager, said the unusually dry weather and high demand for water are putting pressure on the region's water resources. Uh, Tampa Bay faced a cumulative rainfall deficit of 7.6 inches over the prior year. Its 15.5 billion gallon reservoir, normally full at the end of the rainy season, was down to about 12, gall uh, 12 billion gallons at the end of October. Uh, while we have sufficient drinking water supplies to serve the region, we are now asking to take proactive measures to increase the awareness about conserving water and lowering demand. The easiest way to do this is to minimize irrigation. Again, I don't think this is, to me, this sounds reasonable, right? Um, and mm -hmm. again, I wish that you know people had the wherewithal uh, to be able to say, yeah, I'm in a dry weather. It's cool outside. I can. I'm not going to absolutely ravage my lawn by you know, checking up on the water a little bit. And they'll say, 
Look, if you live in the Southeast, you are undergoing uh, an immense drought right now. We just had our driest since September 1st, our driest period on record. Uh, we have had one inch of rain from September 1st through today. And uh, pretty much the entire uh, area of, of Knox County and surrounding areas all the way through the plateau, all the way to Middle Tennessee is under under a, a fire hazard. And there have been fires popping up all over the place because we got a shit ton of brush and open area all over the place. So, you know, it happens. But point being is that, again, you know, uh, 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 take this into account. If you if it's super dry like it is and, uh, you know, look, especially now that it's cool outside, let it just let it go dormant. It's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. Let Everything's going to be OK. Don't go get a second mortgage to buy more essential G and, uh, and put pallets and pallets and pallets down thinking that is going to make water appear out of nowhere. The moisture content in that product is enough to keep it from holding together, but it will not allow it to, uh, uh, water your grass inadvertently. Uh, Monsanto ordered to pay 1.5 billion in roundup case. Ugh, another one, another one. Isn't that a meme? I think that's a meme. Uh, it, it, it should be put up right here. Uh, Monsanto unit was ordered by a Missouri jury to pay more than $1.5 billion to three former users of Roundup Weed Killer who blamed their cancers on the controversial product in one of its largest trial losses in the five-year litigation over the herbicide. Uh, in Jeff City, Missouri, awarded James Drager, Valerie Gunther, and Dan Anderson a total of $61.1 million in actual damages and $500 million each in punitive damages over their claims that using Roundup on their lawns and gardens caused their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Monsanto has been hit with a recent spate of jury verdicts finding its, uh, uh, its Roundup contains carcinogens after it found Roundup contains carcinogens? Can someone cite that link for me, please? <laughs> okay, hold the show. We are pausing the show. Can someone please send me the fucking link that Roundup contains carcinogens? I'm waiting. I don't, I've got multiple points of contact open right now, and none of them are flashing with red notifications. And normally, people are really quick to feed me this information because they love to prove me wrong, deservedly. <laughs> I've still got nothing. I'm going to leave it open. I want someone to send this to me because if I recall correctly, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just another Joe Schmo. But if I recall correctly, the IARC stated contained possible carcinogens. Did I make that up? No, you didn't. Possible is different from definitive. Contains carcinogens. Yeah. Uh, you see, find, uh, jury verdicts finding its roundup contains carcinogens. The jury did not find it contains carcinogens. That's not what's on trial. They are not trialing. They're trialing the damages, right? And they're not trialing a definitive fact. They're arguing corollary, right? That's the whole trial is, is correlation equals causation, right? And they are saying, fuck it. We'll let it go. Who knows? We'll see. We'll let the jury decide. And the jury is deciding that in this particular instance, correlation equals causation. It does not mean that Roundup contains carcinogens. Am I wrong about that? Jesse, in the eyes of the law, does Roundup now contain carcinogens because of these court cases? And, if I, and these these are these are civil cases too, right? Man, I don't know. There's something about that that he, this this is why. Look, if there is anything that is going to go absolute ape shit over the next five years, over the next five years, people who work in traditional media are going to have torches. If people with torches lined up outside of their houses because of shit like that, because of, because of what, you know, for instance, what I saw on CNN the other day, and, and I, and I'm not pointing these out as like liberal news sources. You can find it on Fox news a hundred times over turn on OAN. It's all over there too. But the headline was 
a Jewish man fell and hit his head and died after being struck. Uh, and uh, and as as multiple people there pointed out that no, he was struck in the head with a megaphone and that's what killed him. Uh, it was not. Oh, it said a Jewish man fell and hit his head and died. But it, the reports were, including uh, what was what was captured, was he he hit a guy with a megaphone and it fucking killed him. A college professor did that to an old Jewish dude because they didn't see eye to eye on the, uh, uh, you know, Abrahamic gods warring with one another, right? Again, I'm telling you, man, it's shit like this that creates the crazy that we have going on right now because that is a flat-out fucking lie, and I'm curious who the author is. This is, of course, in Bloomberg as well. I mean, uh, you know, would you expect anything else? Um, let's see. Uh, updates with company comments starting in an earlier version was corrected to clarify the superlative loss in the deck headlines. So they 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 are not going to correct that. I don't know. I'm 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 way out here in in La La Land, and I need to get back on point. Uh, the Missouri. Oh man. Okay, let me let me let me try this again. Uh, they concluded uh, October 31st, the National Association of Realtors and others conspired to Where? What? <laughs> I am, I am, okay, let me do this. Bayer officials said Saturday they believe U.S. judges have allowed former Roundup users to mid-characterize regulatory decisions governing the product safety before juries, and that led to the recent round of playing its wins. We have a strong argument to get the recent unfounded verdicts overturned, which has happened in a lot of the, a lot of the instances, if we haven't been following up with it, but the first guy, you know, he ended up a lot of what he was awarded was overturned. Uh, but he did, I think he did still still get out. And, and then it, look, all this is tragic. Look, I don't want to take away from that either. People dying with cancer is fucking terrible. It's awful. There's nothing worse than it. That's why we do fundraisers for St. Jude. Because for Christ's sake, can we not spare a little bit of fucking civility and hope and and goodness for the fucking children that have to suffer with this? I get it that with tragedy, everyone wants to find a fucking boogeyman, but it does not always end in the word chemical. It does not always end in the word glyphosate. It's not because you eat sugar. It's not because you eat red meat. There's, it is a fucking mutated cell that goes rogue in haywire. And because it is so effective at mutating, it doesn't matter whether you feed it fucking amino acids, proteins, peptides, carbohydrates, glucose, fructose, sucrose. It's going to find a way to continue to fucking replicate because it's fucking cancer. And it is the Matt, worst of the worst. Matt, uh, did you say that the cancer that these people were claiming was associated with glyphosate exposure was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yeah. Okay. Here's what I know about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What I've seen of it is that non-Hodgkin's lymphoma appears at two times in a person's life. First time is between the ages of 12 to 25. That's the first time. Next time it appears is after 50. And you know this non-Hodgkin's lymphoma... Yeah, it's time's up for for the people that get it because do you know why these people even get non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? There is an extremely strong genetic component to it because I want to know, for example, how does... A kid, for example, living in the middle of a, the city that is not even near lawns, farms, or anything that could potentially be treated with a lot of glyphosate, how could a kid get non Hodgkin's lymphoma? And similarly, how could your condo dwelling, you know, person who again is nowhere near a farm, a lawn, or whatever, also come up with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma spontaneously. Because, by the way, the cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that spontaneously occur in people that have no correlating chemical exposure far outweighs 
the number of people that can attribute their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma to, say, a glyphosate exposure. Look, man, I, 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 again, and I'm, I'm going, I'm way off on a tangent over here. They lost the case, and I'll, I'll quote from the, uh, the attorney of the, of the plaintiffs here. Uh, these are the kind of verdicts Bayer can look forward to in future trials. Monsanto has done wrong for so many years in selling Roundup that it's a beautiful thing to have a jury recognize that wrongdoing and punish them for it. Jesse, our resident attorney here, said, uh, you know, Bayer was found negligent, failure to warn of possible adverse effects of the product. It's a tough loss, to be honest. I understand. Um, you know, from an LD50 standpoint, um, uh, uh, table salt, sodium chloride is more acutely uh, 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 toxic, uh, even even deadly than, than glyphosate is. And I do not see any warnings on my Morton's uh, shaker, or, uh, I've got one of the, one of the Morton's grinders, you know, because I'm fancy mm-hmm. and it was on sale for 99 cents at Kroger. And, uh, <laughs> and I like coarse salt because I'm fucking bougie like that. And, uh, and it, it does not have a warning on it. I just picture well, you having a 10 pound salt like in the middle of the table. I'm not opposed well, gee, to it. Well, gee, I mean, I'd let uh, a deer out of my house. Chisel off some in- salt. Bait, case, bait a then, fucking deer in and then and then throat it and eat it yeah. for dinner in front of the kids. Yeah. It'd be like kids. I'm, this is how I'm you in. survive when I'm media in. people completely ruin society because because that is exactly what's happening. Because now people will see this, right? And see, I told you that damn roundup is killing everybody out here. It turned the frogs gay. Now it's killing everybody. And, uh, and, and you know what, uh, Israel is committing a genocide against, against the Palestinians. It all fucking bleeds together into just fucking clown world. We are living in clown world. And I'm stealing a phrase from you, Demay, is that the velocity at which we are, we are passing through the space time continuum into the (laughs) deeper, the deepest depths, depths of clown world is unlike anything I've ever fucking read about in history. This is nuts. It's absurd. Matt, D- Matt this, is, this is truly. Thank you, Dr. Shadow. This is made me feel this is foreign myself. to me as a as a real dinosaur, because you know what? <laughs> I have never seen Rage this kind of craziness in the 1980s. I have not seen this kind of insanity in the 1980s. Sir, I was just born you know, then, so. I didn't have quite my bearings about me for the four years I experienced in the eighties to be able to say one way or another, but I get it. I get yeah, it. Yeah. You know, th- th- this is just, uh, the velocity through which we're passing from reality into clone world is staggering. <laughs> Demay I mean, also, also dad, dad, talk to me here. Am I, am I, <laughs> am I teetering on the cliff? Am I losing my mind? Or is shit like this making us crazy? Let me, let me, let me, instead of going back or looking at the present, right? There's a, there's sure. a James Thurber quote. James Thurber is a famous writer from Columbus, Ohio, dead a long time. But uh, he would say, uh, you know, He's probably don't thankful. look back. Don't look, you know, ahead. Or, anyway, fuck it. Forget the quote. But here's the thing. They're putting all this money. They're putting billions of dollars into the replacement for glyphosate right now. And they're developing that right now. When that comes to market, as anybody's guess, if you talk to people that are insiders, they're saying it's going to be at least five years, possibly 10. And the other thing, too, is that they have to offboard all of uh, the GMOs that are Roundup resistant right now and soybeans and corn and other crops, right? So, um, that whole evolution has to take place within the marketplace as well. But, okay, what kind of warning label will this new product come with? That's my question. I mean, at what point do you just have to say, listen, you're going to have to take your own fucking chances because this product could do anything. You know what? It could do what? anything you wanted to do, it could be anything you needed to do, or it could do things that you don't want it to do, and you are taking the personal responsibility by choosing to use it and I, I wonder too, with with the folks that 
uh, have gone through these lawsuits and God, you know, God forbid that they have cancer and they're dying, they're dead, whatever the case might be. I'm not here to criticize them, but I, I, I do wonder at what point, you know, that you're using a pesticide, a labeled pesticide, mm -hmm. just like we do every day. And we take risks, or, you know, try to mitigate risks, try to use PPE, try to do different things, right, to put ourselves in the best possible position. I'm just worried about what will it take to get this new product to market? Because the challenge is, here's the, here's the thing. And if you connect the dots, Matt, you were talking about connecting dots. Look at what's happening with the re-registration process for different active ingredients. What do you think the registration process for the replacement for glyphosate is going to be like? No. Here's what, what it's going to be. Here's what I, it's going to be no, or if it's not going to be no, here's what's probably going to happen to you to it it will probably appear as a federal rup and i wouldn't doubt it you know guy no and you know what guys you know what constantly astonishes me is due to my age of course i remember when glyphosate aka roundup i remember when the product labeling on glyphosate was extremely specific and limited. And do you know what that labeling was in, at its debut in, in the 1980s? Glyphosate was to be used for vegetation control in non-crop areas within agricultural areas. You see, the usage of glyphosate outside of an agricultural setting happened in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And when it went to the non-agricultural setting, that's when I got the sense that all hell broke loose because that was when I do have to say this about glyphosate's marketers in that I don't think they conveyed any sense of potential danger because in the 1980s even, this was advertised to the farmers as here is your safer replacement for paraquat, diquat, sodium arsenate. Uh, dimethyl arse sodium dimethyl arsenate. Here's your safe replacement for those toxic and hazardous herbicides. So, on the other hand, you know, going to the Wayback Machine, imagine if instead, then Monsanto took this pos position of, at this time, this product is safer than what it is replacing and obsoleting. However, nonetheless, this is still a pesticide and all relevant precautions should be taken with, when, when handling this at all times. Do not let your guard down. Whereas on the other hand, uh, good Lord, you look at a bottle of uh, Paraquat or Diquat, you know damned well, you're handling something that's potentially toxic. It's just not, it's not going to get much better. That's all I'm saying. Uh, yeah, no, it's going to get uh, inherently I, I, yeah. worse. Well, no, it's going to if, if we're we're riding the wave and we're going to crash ashore before too long, and then it'll be interesting to see how things shake out from there. That's why, boy, who get who gets access to the food and who doesn't? I'd love to be the decision maker there. Oh, oh, oh buddy. Um, yeah. How about this? <laughs> Let's move on to something more positive, like uh, an absolute fucking clown in this week's Joe Knows Turf. <laughs> Did I, was that was I too forward Joe when I said that? Am I being modest? I don't even know anymore. 
Where am I? I'm just throwing you know, shit. It's all this. Because, because knows turf. Joe knows does turf, and uh, I'm sure Demay is going to clue us in on who is the most known turf of uh, du jour or de week or de year or whatever. Yeah, yeah, know you know. Um, listen, we'll probably get shit because uh, this this gentleman here is a usual suspect. On this feature, uh, seemingly gets a shot in at least once a month, and uh, we were sent another one, and it's actually a, a very relevant question, and I wanted to address it. But first, let's watch Ron uh, stumble like a drunk uh, sorority girl down the alleyway and uh, try to answer this question. Ron, take it away. Mm. I dig it. All right, we got Vahid Navi from the great, uh, from Canada, from up north, saying, hey, hi hey there, Ron. Hey, Chaley. Uh, what is the best time to put down video. dormant grass seed? Thank you. In Canada. I, I mean, why would you put, I guess, why would you put down, what do you mean by dormant grass seed? You, are you saying, like, put down, apply grass seed when the lawn is dormant and just with the expectation that it's going to germinate in the spring? If that's what you're asking, I wouldn't do that. I would apply the grass seed, I would sow the grass seed whenever conditions are correct for it to germinate and begin growing in. I wouldn't go out there and put out grass seed like when it's winter in the middle of winter time, uh, just saying, you know, whenever springtime rolls around, I'm hoping it's going to germinate. That's, that's not a strategy that I would uh, that I would employ. So if that's the question you're asking, assuming I'm reading it properly, I understand what you're asking. My answer would be like, never, I would not, I would not do that. I would wait until conditions are right for the grass to germinate. And I would apply, I would, you know, do all your prep work and then, uh, you know, put your, put your grass seed out and, and then, and allow it to come in. That's what I would do. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't like, for example, if you're planning on, if we, if we use your example, let's say I wanted to do a renovation of my Bermuda lawn, right? Which I don't know why you would do this time of year and say someone's going to go put out like grass seed now, right? Bermuda grass seed now, which would not be the time to do it with the expectation that it's going to germinate in like May time frame. Like that, I just wouldn't do that. Like it's going to be sitting there. It's not going to germinate. You know, birds may get to it. It's just, it's just why, 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 um, why put the grass seed out, which is expensive. Like good grass seed is expensive. Why put it out and just have it sit on the lawn or in the, in the surface of the soil for months without, with little to no chance of it germinating when you could just wait until conditions are ideal. So I wouldn't do that, Vahid, if that's what you're asking. And uh, if you have any other questions, then let me know. Uh, just real quick, okay, uh, J Jago wanted to know if uh, if he is a legit study professional or a byproduct, um, hundred percent byproduct. Uh, is is from an unrelated industry, just a backyard warrior who, uh, uh, you know, got really good at B roll with with you know three five thousand dollar camera setups and then you know played played the algorithm game. Go ahead, Demi. so. Really, Ron's summary uh, could be put in this and that uh, I don't know. And that would have mm -hmm. taken mm -hmm. two seconds as opposed to the two plus minutes of incoherent babbling that took place right there. Uh, even though Ron may not realize this, but lawn care does exist in other places outside of Flowery Branch, Georgia. Uh, and so... Because of this, this is a question that we get a lot this time of year, and I thought it would be relevant, one, to let Ron set us up because he did such a great fucking job uh, that we'd move into and look at. Actually, so the guy is from Canada who asked the question. And actually, some of the most relevant uh, research right now on dormant seating is coming out of a place that's not too far away uh, in uh, Twin Cities, Minnesota. So the University of uh, Minnesota. It's the same done. thing. Be honest. It's it's the it's same kind of thing. <laughs> they talk the same. They're always sorry. It's it's <laughs> it's the same. Hey, Pink, go to the first go to the first link here. Uh, so uh, this was uh, work initiated here by uh, let's see here a gentleman named Andrew Holman. Assuming he's a uh, graduate student there, I don't know for a fact, but Andrew was curious because during the Minnesota State Fair. A bunch of people came up and asked them about, um, you know, planting new cultivars and ways that they could convert over 
maybe an easier path than a traditional fall seeding and having to water and all that kind of stuff. So what they described as dormant seeding would be when your soil temperature drops below 40 degrees, right? So uh, for much of the Midwest, Northeast, we're still above that. So it's really still not an opportune time to dormant seed if that's what you're actually going for, okay? So um, what they say here is that this temperature seed is unable to absorb water, but it will not, it, or it will, is able to absorb water, but it does not germinate until conditions become favorable in the spring. There you go, Ron. Uh, typical seeding could be done in the Twin Cities around the second week of November, but this can vary. A danger of dormant seeding is seeding too early. The seed will germinate and the seedings will not survive winter. So again, too early uh, and you have problems. The University of Minnesota has done quite a bit of, uh, you know, efficacy trials on this over the last few years and talked about, you know, different uh, attrition rates and things you might see. So as we get on through here, what they decided to do is plant um, about 15 different plots of uh, different mixes up there and uh, most of this stuff is got uh, some form or fashion of fine fescue in it uh, and then they've got a, a tall fescue all by itself in plot 14 and perennial ryegrass all by itself in uh, plot 15. So if you slide down here you'll see that they prepped these and then they covered some of these they left some of them as bare soil and then the other ones they applied uh, roundup to to kill off the existing grass and then seed into that okay they also placed um, sensors into the ground, right? To try and understand what um, soil moisture would look like and some of the other attributes there within the soil, okay? So let's flip over to the second link here, Jay Pink. This is, uh, so that was back in April that they posted that kind of first phase of it. This is a post uh, from recently, about six weeks ago, uh, from October 6th, where they update and kind of show some of the differences. So if we slide down here to that next picture, so you can see here, they use seed matting or, or erosion control mats uh, on most of the treatments. Some of the treatments were bare soil. And then uh, if you'll see here in the photo, see, this is where they sprayed out the turf and then seeded into that directly. Okay. So this is on April 12th. We're looking at this picture. So uh, nothing is really germinated yet. And if we slide down and continue to go down here. All right. So. Dormant seeding. So this is five eight. So this is uh, just a few weeks later as it starts to warm up there in Minnesota. And you can see, uh, for the folks that are audio only, our seed cover or erosion control blankets are doing uh, exceedingly well. Uh, not far behind uh, is the dead grass, right? So the glyphosate spray out and seed into it method, and then followed by uh, very far behind the bare soil method. So no covers, no nothing. Uh, really nothing coming up there. Very, very small, sparse seedlings. So keep going down, Jay Pink. And they're talking about some of the more uh, difficult to establish uh, species there in the middle of summer. Keep going, keep going, keep going. All right. So interesting here. Uh, they were pretty dry this summer. They did apply a supplemental irrigation after this stuff to get going. And again, if we're looking at uh, the soil, the bare soil um, regime here, you've got a lot of. Uh, a lot more open space, right? So non-green cover on those ones, but ones that were covered with the erosion control blanket, far and away, doing great. Uh, and kind of mixed results over here, uh, depending by species. So um, particularly on some of the fine fescues, you get their butts kicked on the uh, spray and seed method with the dead grass. So again, what we're finding here is that some form of insulation, some form of erosion control makes a big difference in these particular situations. So uh, this is this is some really, really good work. So the point here, gentlemen, uh, that was uh, to be made is that from a timing perspective, uh, don't necessarily go by the calendar. You know, we want to be below 40 degrees soil temperature. So again, that that seed can get moist, but it will not germinate, right? Um, freezing of the seed, all that kind of stuff is not going to you know impact it to a great, a large degree. You will see some attrition um, in some of the earlier work by the University of Minnesota. Theirs were anywhere from 10 to 15% per month, depending on uh, the time of year that you plant it. So the earlier you planted it, the more likely that you are to lose stuff. But going down here, yeah, this is 927. Still seeing the same effects of um, bare soil, uh, grass not filled in all the way, things like that. But uh, from the spray and uh, seed method to the covered method, pretty much. I uh, can't tell just from a visual aspect. So gentlemen, again, lawn care does exist outside of, uh, go back to that real quick too, Jay Pink. There's one thing I want to show on that last little bit of the article, but um, going down, just those four questions they have at the end. 
Um, Lawn care does exist outside of Flowery Branch. Gentlemen. I don't know if you knew that or not. I wanted to make it clear in case you had not picked up on that, in case you had graduated from the Golf Course Lawn Academy and never left Flowery Branch ever after you graduated. Um, there are things that do exist. So it's interesting here. Andrew came up with a few questions after, um, after his experiment here. So questions he still has is, will late season application of glyphosate always leave the turf grass death in the spring? Uh, does germination blanket inhibit germination of some bee lawn species? Could be something there because they were doing some bee lawn um, or, or pollinator lawn mixes in there. Is there a quick growing annual crop that could be planted as a nurse crop to eliminate the need for germination blankets or herbicide application? Maybe vetch, crown vetch, good one. How long will it take to transition to a lower input species if dominant seeding is into a Kentucky blue restaurant? So they're really looking at a lot of this fine fescue if stuff, dormant. guys. Sorry. If dormant, if dormant, sorry. If dormant. Time's up, it's over. So, I don't know. Gentlemen, what are your thoughts here? Any, anything you want to share? About cl- uh, clown world? He, Speaking of, we went from clown world to clown world here. <laughs> One thing I want, I want to make clear is that I, I, I see a, a lot of times, like um, you run into a situation where uh, you have a project that created major chaos and disturbed every turf grass surface you have in your, in your, on your property, right? And you're like, you know, hey, Ron, um, so I had some work done in my backyard, and uh, I was going to see if it's all right to go ahead and dormant seed it I'm in Canada, by the way. And he's like, why would you do that? Doesn't make sense to me. Bermuda grass, if I put it down now, it's not going to germinate till May. Doesn't make sense. Okay, Here, here's the thing is that I think on burn and return specifically, we have covered enough issues of problems that arise from soil washing, right? Um, please do your part and preserve your soil, whether that means using dormant seeding as a tool to, to uh, and, and blankets to help hold erosion, whatever you need to do in that regard, because um, you, you, the great thing about turf grass is that it is the ultimate soil stabilizer. Uh, you know, it, the, the great thing about it is that you can hold fucking sand in place with grass. It's amazing. Doesn't make any damn sense, but it'll do it. Right. Um, so you, you, it's, it's not that simple to just say, uh, it doesn't make sense. And again, you know, it hundred percent, it's okay to say, I don't know. And I'm again, legitimately, that's why I wanted, I want someone to send me definitive a definitive peer-reviewed published paper that says glyphosate or, or Roundup uh, is a carcinogen. You know, I want to be wrong. I want to be wrong. How much easier? Stop. Stop, Matt. Go ahead. Ray, anything to add? Yeah. You know, this is a case <laughs> of if somebody doesn't no. definitively know Sometimes it's best to just say, I don't, I don't know. However, do you know what I love about our group? Is that each of us knows about growing grass and dealing with grass under different circumstances. And so if somebody were to ask me, can I dormant seed or late season seed, and I'm above the transition zone, then I would check in with uh, Ryan, and Ryan would say, yeah, go for it, send it. (laughs) I wouldn't be yammering my mouth about seeding Bermuda or seeding centipede grass when the person asking the question is in damned Canada, for Kevin's sake. He's in Canada. I, I, I do. I'll, I'll try and provide a little balance here. Um, when you are live streaming and you are trying to take into account all the variables that come in front of you, it can be very difficult. I, I will. Mm-hmm. I will give him that. Why mm-hmm. I will bust his balls more than I will other people is because he continually makes recommendations like how much carbon G should I apply, and his answer is as much as you can afford. Okay. And that is a that is a legitimate quote. So when you have a track record of saying things like that, uh, then one hundred percent, I I will I will put 
I will go knee deep up your rectum over something trivial like asking a Canadian dude, why the hell would you dormant seat? He could have been legitimately asking him that because he's like, I don't know what goes on in Canada. Why would you do that? And then the Canadian guy in turn has to answer to him. Well, I'm in Canada and see, we have a narrow growing w- a window and the, there's actually uh, uh, some pretty significant data that, that shows uh, uh, good outcomes out of University of Minnesota. And then it's a learning thing, right? But it's impossible to interpret that way because, again, this is a huckster who is selling <laughs> uh, uh, a Zoxystrobin for uh, Pythium and... I'm I'm sure if 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 the money is right, he would 100% sell his oxygen for dollar spot, and uh, and we know that the 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 limit, the rate limit, the bag limit of of his granular compost is uh, is literally as much cash as you can as you can come across. So uh, you get no sympathy from me. You sir may fuck off. Uh, let's check out this week's burns. Maybe we'll get Ron Henry on the show in 2024. What do you think? I mean, yeah. he, considering how banned he has me, like, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's weird when you comment on something in the chat and your name doesn't even show up when you submit it. I'm like, wow, I am ultra filtered somehow, some way. <laughs> it's impressive. Uh, in the Hamptons, a thousand citations issued for cars parked on lawns. Uh <laughs> And this is Hampton, Virginia. Uh, you can't park your, your 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 you can't park on your lawn in Hampton. The rule has been a city ordinance for more than a year, and the city says that it's time. And they've issued 950 citations. It's a matter of appearances. We want the city to look as attractive and as beautiful as possible. It's been an ordinance since July 1st, 2022, but they're still not on board. Does the city expect us to park on another street and walk home? I think it's unfair. <laughs> Paid a lot of money in fucking property taxes. And I, I mean, I get it. I, trust me, I get it, dude. I am with I, you, Lisa Osborne. I so badly, uh, when I saw this article and put it in here, wanted you to, without even thinking about it, read that in the Southern accent, because this is the most <laughs> fucking SEC bullshit I've seen in the news in a while. You mean we can't park on our lawns? My daddy fought and died for the CSA. Well, we won. Pay the fucking fine. <laughs> The option is to move your car to the street if parking is available, but Renee Clement said that's not our first choice either. You got to park your cars on the street and they get vandalized or they get hit, and then we're responsible to pay for it. Uh, Holtzclaw said you will get a notice uh, to move your car if you're long before further action is taken. We're not looking to drag people into court. It's not the intention of this. Uh, there are some exceptions like loading and unloading flooding events and if no street parking is available. So, uh, a bunch of here, here's, a, here's a question. For everybody, oh, man, let them park on their in this for Christ's sake. No, in this <laughs> in this communist Just town, bumpkins. <laughs> no, in this communist town. Yes, right. How yes. many of the homes were came with actual facilities to park vehicles? Okay, how many? Because I'm familiar with homes and even entire neighborhoods. Where there is no carport, there ain't no detached garage, there ain't no garage on the first floor of the house. In other words, the only place where you can park a vehicle is either on the street or off of city property in your front yard. And you know what? I would probably do, if I had to deal with this kind of authoritarian bullshit. What would you do, Ray? I would literally... Buy a bigger lawn to park more cars? <laughs> yes. And then, what I would do, Ryan... Lot, wait, wait, wait. I got, I got a better one. Go ahead first. Is I, I, I would turn my front yard into a parking garage it will probably be like a like like a four or five bay garage and then heaven help the fucking bureaucrat that questioned or challenged me about building that fucking garage because i told him well 
you don't want me to park on the lawn. I understand that. I get that. That does look a little bit redneck. I get it. <laughs> but you, the city, like you, the city, cannot even ensure that my property is safe when it is parked on your street as you stipulate. How do you resolve that? Please kindly make that make sense to me. And if you cannot make that make sense to me, then fuck off. Okay. There's two things I want to <laughs> I want to make mention of here. The first is that at some point this actually happened this scenario. Marty, nice guy, probably walks into work on a Monday and they say, "Hey Marty, there's a new uh town ordinance and you're in charge of uh of writing all the citations for it. it's cars parked in the lawn and marty took a drag of his winston looked out at the ground threw it down put it out and like i gotta write a thousand fucking citations today boys and they can be good because <laughs> <laughs> he knew he's been up and down and look at it, he just knew it was gonna be a bad day okay the second thing is i have I, I have a perfect answer to your scenario ray a perfect answer we're gonna do a role reversal here we're gonna bulldoze the house not the lawn to build a bigger lawn so you can park more cars because remember you can't drive your house to work but you can take your car there and you can live in your car <laughs> i'm not parking on my lawn i'm living on my lawn sir yeah so there exactly you go. Well, I mean, house I, bigger lawn yeah it, well leave it see, leave Jesse it to the fine rednecks of virginia to be so mad at the government they <laughs> rip their house down just to Somebody's live in their car and say you can't cite me now bitch you know there's people that'll do it 100 percent. well somebody's gonna run for mayor of this town and be like all right listen all right hear me out no new taxes and you can park on your lawn again and that guy's gonna win by 30 points. <laughs> well here's here's what i know about virginia i'm, mayor. I'm king <laughs> here's what i know about virginia in that you know, you, you all asked me about which state would I be likely to relocate to? Oh, yeah. Virginia is the state that I would avoid like the plague. Listen, <laughs> I remember this is a long time ago. Go ahead. And the reason why I'd avoid it like the plague is because I know that Virginia has these authoritarian tendencies. Uh, because, I don't know. I, uh, oh, because let me tell let me tell you guys another little you know anecdote that is kind of interesting is, you know, here in Hawaii, I can kind of tell what state somebody is posted at Pearl Harbor, where they're from originally, and do you know how I know? The people that are from Virginia, they take special care always be at least a mile per hour under the speed limit because in virginia the police officers enforcing the traffic laws are absolute dicks uh, uh, yeah i i don't okay. know i think there's uh it's something else and god god help him i remember uh Long time ago on Ryan Norris podcast, we were talking. Somebody had emailed a question about somebody who had uh, they bought a new house and somebody had put mulch, Ray, like six inches of mulch. And maybe they were doing it so they could park their cars there. Six inches of mulch across the entire lawn. And this poor bastard mm -hmm. was trying to seed into it. And he's like, I can't get anything to grow. Oh, Lord. And my only, my, my a very first uh, instantaneous reaction to Ryan Norris when he asked me that question was, well, Virginia's for lovers, but somebody hated this fucking lawn. And, uh, <laughs> off we go. So, uh, don't move to Virginia, Ray. We got it settled here tonight. Uh, city City Council discusses lawn maintenance and speeders, uh, according to the America America's Times recorder. Oh, yeah, first, half uh, first half of this article. Uh, we had a hard time filling five corrections officers' positions. Uh, he added, it's hard to keep five crews. Uh, Sis Trunk did mention some positives. They seem to be doing a lot better with the equipment. Uh, <laughs> the amount paid to contractors was also addressed by City Council member Daryl Dowdle. Uh, the amount we were spending has drastically increased. Pre-COVID, the inmates were cutting all the parks. 
they were cutting all the city buildings. But now we're paying the contractors, and we are faced with raises. Uh, Council member Juanita Wilson also commented on the quality of lawn maintenance. We need to have a better inspection. Uh, Council member Nicole Smith voiced, voiced similar concerns. Where's the accountability saying that what we are what they are paid to do has been done to our satisfaction? That, <laughs> that sounds exactly like something Nicole would say, doesn't it? I'm not satisfied. Uh, Sis Trunk addressed a request. About, uh, it's all, that's Do all dumb stuff. You don't need to read oh. that part. That was It was just the first half. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, right. inmates oh, mowing the lawns in America's, in America's Georgia and Nicole. They were doing great. Is not, is she not, she's not happy. She wants more accountability, you know? What are you going to do, Nicole? Send her back to fucking jail? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what do you they're making like 17 cents an hour. They're just trying to buy. I know that's what I said. We're faced with here. raises now to a quarter. We, <laughs> no, we, we just raised. Oh, yeah. She, she was worried contract. about the contractors. She was worried about the contractors. But yeah. listen, guys, it, it, no, at no other point, you know, uh, would I have expected to bring a, uh, a Z return and a weed whip to a conjugal visit. But here we are. <laughs> hey. <laughs> You know what? When in Rome. This would be the use. This would be the use case for that, that super C. duper, uh, robotic mower, right, Matt and Ryan? Oh, this would yeah. be the I can use only case. imagine what the raises are on that, though. Ooh, yeah, new software yeah. that'll cost you. Yeah, that. However, again, in order to make this work, uh, those areas that are being mowed by the robotic mower then need to be on the full on you know, high-end agronomic program. I mean, gross regulation, weed control, you know, fertilization, you know, send it all. Ah, these people, they don't, they don't give a shit. Um, yeah. Let's check out this week's returns. La, I just want to complain. La, la, I want to feel important. La, 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 I'm so important. I'm city council. La, 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 I ran on parking in your front yard and whatever else. Uh, Sunday beer sales. Uh, yeah, Sunday beer sales. Uh, Henry Lansbury, the lawn obsessed ex Arsenal starlet who wants to mow the Emirates. Uh, 15 years after he graduated from Arsenal's famed academy, the butterflies are still battering in his stomach. The nerves, though, are not about football. He remains close with the ground staff, and when he recently bought new lawn mowers, they invited him in. Sweet, I'll be straight up there, was his response. Lansbury dream, dreams of one day cutting the Emirates pitch. This was a mini audition. I started all right, he began seriously, then he laughs. They started talking to me, and I was like, uh, don't talk to me, don't talk to me. My strap was horrendous. They, uh, they had to go over it again. Uh, grass is the recently retired 33 year old's passion. Did I, did I read that correctly? The recently retired 33 year old's passion must be nice. Mm -hmm. I'd started when a gardener left Lansbury's lawn, uh, long during lockdown, he quickly phoned a friend to borrow the requisite kit. His love at first strife. It's satisfying straight away, isn't it? Lansbury eyes wide. The euphoria is real. I was looking back and thinking, wow, that was it. I was mowing, mowing three times a week. Summers have, uh, have since. Uh, become about hosting parties for his children, in which Lansbury uh, gorges on parental praise. Uh, when they turn up and say, wow, look at your grass, that's like scoring a goal for me. Not that Lansbury is precious about his hollow turf. Uh, trampolines, bouncy castles, I'm with him on it. The dog flies around, tearing it all up. I just get my little pitchfork for uh, out and replace the divots. They mock it up, and that gives me an excuse to get back out. Uh, not con uh, not content with tent content. <laughs> content with tending the family lawn, Lansbury sourced a cheap white van. The geezers turned up. Showed him the running engine and departed rapidly. Central locking didn't work. Side door didn't open. It was falling apart. I've had it wrapped now. There's Astro in the back for the lawnmowers. Uh, if I see a patch that needs cutting, I'll do it. Uh, he also mows for friends and family. While in the midweek, he runs free trim Tuesdays. If I see a patch of grass, I'll stop and do it. Uh, what about diversifying? I don't like doing hedges or flower beds. That's not me. I'm strictly grass. Uh, anyway, like kudos guy. to this guy. Yeah, he's, uh, well, I don't because who, who really enjoys mowing grass unless you're a complete and total psychopath. Hi there. Crazy. Nor. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Bat shit fucking nuts. Connor Ward off your rocker. 99% of everybody in the discord, 99.9% .9 of everybody in the discord. Y'all are fucked up. I don't know if I'm, if I'm the odd man out, let's be honest. I might be the problem. I might be the psychopath. I Hardly right, Matt. 
Hardly. <laughs> Hardly. Uh, making a difference, a nonprofit lawn care company uh, is helping people with disabilities grow and succeed. Um, Rachel Pollock grew up in a single parent home, served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Romania, and wanted to be a dentist. She earned a master's degree in archaeology at Brigham Young University and participated in archaeology digs in southern Utah. Yet she has chosen a different sort of digs <laughs> when it comes to finding new clothes, clues to humanity. Uh, early on in her life, even before her college degrees, Pollock worked with individuals with disabilities. During the past 24 years, she's worked with Chrysalis, a company that works with individuals with disabilities. She fell in love with the work. It became her home, her way of life. I fell in love with the people I worked with. They've always have some fun story. They're enjoyable. The longer I was there, I enjoyed it. They have uh, they have come to lots of family events. Although they have their own family, they call my uncle, uncle, my grandpa, grandpa. They've become my family. Uh, Oliver Booth, a father of five children, was born in India and adopted when he was young. He married a Navajo woman, attended Utah Valley University, and majored in communications with an emphasis in public re relations. He worked the oil and mining industry until 2015 when the oil crisis hit. That's when he met Pollock at Chrysalis. Currently, he is associate director of Eaton Alliance, a service provider in Utah, who seeks to make a difference in the lives of other people with disabilities. While working with people with disabilities over the year, uh, they have witnessed some challenges emerging constantly. Having been in the industry, we've seen gaps where services are not meeting the needs of indi individuals. We've seen where legislation gets in the way of success and where legislation can pave new paths. What we want to do is help people overcome the challenges they face in their community. One of the areas that's seen the gaps is employment. The gaps are real barriers to success in the community. We wanted to fill as many gaps as we could by providing training, jobs, and experience to create real opportunity for people with disabilities. Uh, their objective is to provide individuals with disabilities skill sets to step towards self-sufficiency and financial stability to create a world where anyone can belong as a valuable member of a community. Making It Green has masterfully designed programs towards employment, housing, transportation, healthy living, recreation, and services to individuals with disabilities and their caregivers. We do this with the assistance of volunteers and the generosity of donors. So if I have it here, they have started a lawn care company that operates as a nonprofit to bring people in with disabilities and, uh, and help them develop a skill set uh, where they get to be number one in nature, number two, get real-time feedback on the fruit of their labor, and, uh, and number three, have a skill that is marketable uh, in order to, to be able to uh, become an independently sovereign member of society. Fucking kudos to these people, right? I'll say this yeah. is with the, with, if, you, if you took a look at the cross-section of... Uh, of the people in this industry, it legitimately includes everyone from every walk of life there is. Uh, and, you know, I, I, a lot of this, I, I go back to 2009 during the, during the housing uh, crisis. I mean, I saw guys with master's degrees that were taking jobs at True Green and just absolutely fell in love with it. And I, I think, I think of one guy who uh, eventually was able to get a job back in his field. And it's funny because still to this day, he will message me from time to time about some wild ass uh, memory he has from True Green just to say, hey, check on you, see how you're doing. And of course, you know, he's making fucking $500,000 a year now back at his uh, his original career as an investment guy. But uh, it's just it's it's a trip. It draws people in from all walks of life. Of course, you know, it, it drags in the trailer trash, too. And I've seen I've seen people without uh, a, a lick of ability in any other capacity coming into this industry and do really, really well for themselves. And that's what I absolutely love about it is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a token of uh, uh, or, or representative of, of one's direct IQ, but what it, what it does demand is uh, an ability to read, pay attention, interact with, and, uh, and, and enjoy nature, right? You, 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 ha you have to have all of those things because again, the the probably the most self defeating part of it all for for the uh, for the philosophers out there is that this is a battle that you'll never win. You never win. You'll have little wins along the way, but no matter how you spin it, how you slice it, over your career, it is always designed for you to lose. It's the casino. It's the casino of 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 life, right? And uh, <laughs> but at the same time. Uh, you know, there is there is real joy and value that arises every year. Again, one of the things that I think is never, ever going to be replicable for me is that that spring day where you, you hear every bird, you can smell water um, and, and it just it's it's a weird silence, but full of fucking noise and smells and and visuals. 
uh, just every fucking color at once flood your eyeballs, and it is it's better than any drug that is out there. Um, until until Miss Jones comes out and says, "Hi, the lawn boys here," and you're and you're ready to go jump in front of a truck coming down the road. But um, you know, you get those those moments there that are just un- unparalleled, and uh, and I don't think you can replicate it in any other industry. I was I was joking about that part. That was a joke. It was a bad one. It was tasteless. Uh, how big of a truck? Are we, are we a sh- is eighteen fucking wheeler? I, if okay. it was a steamroller, I'm, it's okay. Probably, oh, probably a ten ton though to make it quick. Tell, 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 I was gonna say, tell the steamroller to slow down. Would be tell the eighteen wheeler to speed up. Yeah, just to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> say, or, or jump in a wood chipper, either or. You know. <laughs> Yikes, uh, Joe. Yikes. We've got a mailbag uh, today. You've got mail. We do wow. have mail. Joe said, uh, "I finally." I've gotten the okay to spend the money on irrigation for my 10,000 square foot lawn. Any tips how I should approach local installers or specific questions I should ask to weed out the bad ones? Ray, I feel like you went over this with Eric Sands before in the Discord. Uh, what, is a, what is a quick one, two, three question that you would ask an installer to, uh, to, to qualify their skill set? Okay. I would first ask them... Provide me with your intended design of the actual irrigation system. And any further questions, I would then be basing my further questions on that design that they provide me because what I frequently see in irrigation systems is undersized piping, uh, inappropriate irrigation heads and then finally i also see inappropriate zoning of the actual irrigation system like for example i never want to see shrub and flower areas tied into the same zone as a lawn i also don't want to see parts of the lawn that are in shade also tied in to the same zone that waters a part of the lawn that's in full sun all day. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into an irrigation system, and like those issues were exactly the issues that I went over with Eric uh, in the Discord. And like in Eric's case, I had questions for his installer because his installer wanted to install irrigation in a one acre lawn using only one inch pipe. I had questions for his installer on that basis (laughs) already. And come to find out, postscript, Eric's installer installed an irrigation system based on Eric's input that he based on conversations that he and I had. In other words, Eric didn't end up with one inch pipe. He ended up with much larger pipe. And he was happy for it. Yeah, d- d- definitely. If, you know, the easiest thing I think is is to see is where they start putting sprays and rotors on the same zone. That is infuriating. Oh, uh, oh yeah. A couple other things That's that you bad... can ask is is uh, not just PSI, but what's your flow rate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what's, uh, because if, they, if they can't answer that, they're not going to be able to tell you, you know, like how many heads can you have on a zone. Mm-hmm. Actually, you know. The the problem that I saw was this guy wanted to give Eric an irrigation system where at the end of the day, he would have to run that irrigation system for 24 hours straight to put down a half an inch of water over his one acre lawn. And I said, I am sorry, but that under no circumstances is that acceptable that is unacceptable and please don't tell me the story that 
that is how everybody else in town has their irrigation system installed because I have a lot of people telling me, oh, but that is how everybody else does it. Well, you know what? Everybody else can go get fucked for doing such a piss poor job and not doing it right. How about them apples? Get fucked your uh, <laughs> dot com. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, Joe, um, yeah, there's it, there there are a few things. Make sure they do understand flow rate, uh, all all that other shit, not just PSI, uh, so that way you can get an accurate measurement that they are, you know, going to deliver the appropriate amount of water for the nozzle size selection and all that other shit, right? So um, yeah, out outside of that. Yeah, good luck. I would say out of the say you get five quotes, how many do y'all expect will be decent? One. Well, I mean, I did, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a one. He may such live a, in it's a area. crap. It's like rock a, stars. One and, I, and I would, maybe if he's in a he's in an area where everybody does the same old bullshit, none. They're all wrong. I would yeah, I would I would ask for an itemized quote so that you know and you can compare i would have them break down labor in one line item materials in another and make sure they list out all the materials you're going to use linear footage of pipe size of pipe number of uh you know spray heads number of rotor heads valves valves show Mm -hmm. it all to me so that when i look at them i know that i'm getting apples to apples and it's not you know two thousand dollar teddy that's going to come in here and slap dick my fucking system in there so (laughs) <laughs> no sleptic systems can't do it no no none uh we are going to call this week's episode uh a couple of notes real quick is uh thursday obviously we're going to be off it's thanksgiving and uh and then the sunday we'll be off too i will not uh i will not i will be driving back from florida so i'll not not be able to do that so uh <laughs> anyway we'll get something figured out because uh boy we've got christmas coming up and that is going to be <laughs> Fun. Uh, everyone <laughs> have a very very happy thanksgiving hug your family love your family do great things together share stories and uh and build each other up because uh it's a fucking 23 2023 is a wild one remember when they said 2021 was going to be the worst year of the world um how about how about it's just going to get weird from that point forward right welcome to the worldwide of weird at 2023 hey and we'll catch y'all on the flip side bye